Okay, everyone, welcome to uh, week one in psychology of play. We are going to be doing uh, an introduction to play as well as going over play our play history and highlighting um, much of those concepts in our week one, our module one uh, part of the playbook. So the session is being recorded um, for those of you who are, who are here live with us. Thanks so much for coming out. And then um, those of you who could not make it and plan on watching the archive later on our YouTube channel. So I will go ahead and I wanted to uh, try to screen share here and or hop on my webcam rather and uh, just give a quick hello. So hello out there. Um, hopefully everyone is doing well so far this week. Um, my name is Katie Bonafilia. As most of you know, I'll be working with you this month in psychology of play. So I just want to give you a big warm welcome. Um, it's day three of class. We have a lot of exciting material this month. Um, I'll be hosting the live sessions each week. Uh, I'll go ahead and pull up uh, next a survey that I like to throw out to uh, everybody and toss out that link to you. It's on our classroom portal, and basically it's just a quick survey to um, see when you're available. So I always start off the uh, week one session, usually uh, midday. Sometimes availability is in the morning. It's in the afternoons. Uh, sometimes it's in the evening, dinner time, so forth. So I like to survey my students every month. Month. So if you plan on trying to make it to the live sessions and not just watching the recordings or the archives, um, I'll definitely like for you to fill out that survey so I can get a sense of where everyone is at and then plan our weeks two, our weeks three, and our final week, um, week four appropriately to try to um, meet everybody as, as much as I can. Um, so anyways, um, again, welcome. And I'm going to go ahead and turn my webcam off and we will get started with the material and uh, definitely save some time at the end for any questions uh, on anything that we go over or any of our work that is due uh, this week for week one. Okay, so um, if you take a look at my screen, uh, I just want to highlight this web tool called Storybird. Uh, what you'll notice each week is that I will uh, build the go-to training uh, material or slides, if you will, the information within a different web tool. And I just kind of pulled some web tools from our activity resource list in your getting started section. Um, the activity resource list highlights all these different uh, programs, whether it be you know software programs such as PowerPoint um, if it you know uh, word you know uh, yeah like word and PowerPoint um, for some I know I think you got acclimated with Google documents a little bit uh, in digital literacy last month but then also some different web tools storybird being one of them uh, there's also Pinterest Tundu, Prezi uh, there's a lot of different ones on there so I put together that activity resource list for all of you to simply just kind of serve as a starting point um, because every week you have a project. Um, so you have four projects total. They're called your challenge assignments and with that, you are uh, answering the questions on the PDF template. I post questions there for you. So you'll type out your responses on the PDF template and you'll save it. And that's part one of the project. And part two of the project is actually putting together a creative presentation. So you are not limited to use any medium. And my list that I put together for you, again, just serves as a starting point. It's not all inclusive. So if there's a another web tool or piece of software, for instance, that you want to try out this month, you want to master your skills in, and definitely feel free to use that each week for your project as well. And you don't have to use the same ones um, every single week. I actually encourage you to try different ones each week, um, just because with 
uh, moving forward in your coursework and putting together presentations and, you know, professional presentations outside of school even. Um, definitely, I just want to give you as many options and give you kind of a month to practice some new tools and put different styles of presentations together. So really kind of dabble in your technical skill and uh, go from there. That's a really great month uh, this month to do that. So anyways, back to uh, the web tool I use this week. This is called storybird.com. It's a free based web tool. And so what I did was I went ahead and put some slides together and our objectives and other information from module one. And I used some of the different artwork that they have available. So I didn't stay with just one theme for the artwork. I kind of dabbled in a lot of the different artwork that they have just to give you an idea of some of the artwork. Um, so there's many different themes, templates. The great thing about using this web tool is that the artwork is housed here. So basically you would be adding the written content and depending on uh, if you use this for your project and what you were trying to accomplish with it. But anyways, um, it's just really great. A lot of other uh, programs, for instance, if you use PowerPoint, sometimes they have clip art and other things that you can use for images. But if you want to grab anything from the internet, then of course you're going to want to be referencing it and so forth at the end of your presentation or within the image on your slide. So one of the things that's really great about um, Prezi, you'll see Picto chart this month as well. Uh, Storybird here on my screen is that the artwork is already within that web tool. So there's no additional referencing there. So anyways, let's get started with the week one material. Um, now that I've given you a little bit of introduction as far as um, the activity this week and then as well as the web tool component. All right, so here are our objectives for today's session. Um, so we're going to go ahead and identify the importance of play and discuss the definition of play. We're going to take a quick snapshot of our um, talk about play history, and it's going to coincide with um, taking a look at our play histories. And then uh, if we have time, review patterns of play and adventure through some play personalities. There's a great play personalities video for you on our activity dashboard as well. And then these highlights are definitely going to be important for our weekly uh, week one discussion board activity that's due this evening. So tonight being Wednesday, you have an initial discussion board activity post due. So this information will be really important for formulating that if you haven't had the chance to look at it yet. And then we also have your library activity due uh, this evening as well. And uh, for those of you who haven't had a chance to take a look or um, complete that, there's two parts. It's level 1.0. And the first part is the instructions, uh, where you're basically looking up an article uh, through the library on EBSCOhost, the case for play, and then what you're doing is you are using that article to answer five quiz questions in part two. So those are the two activities due this evening. So let's dive a little bit more into these five objectives. So I always like to pose the question and get the um, get you thinking about you know what you guys thought when you saw psychology of play you know on your schedules what were your th first thoughts about you know what is this class going to be about you know um, what are we going to learn oftentimes sometimes I get responses in regards to uh, theater and the history of plays and um, you know it's definitely a lot more than that. Really the main focus this month is, you know, bringing together all these different concepts of play to impact both on the personal and professional uh, style, if you will, because on the professional side of things, as we know, there's been a lot of game changers, you know, in different industries. And so we talk a lot about that this month as well, and how you can bring playfulness into the workplace and kind of present at, you know, something that is you know, refreshing and new. And so we want you to go into your industries with a lot of these different types of skills and tools. 
So, oh, okay, Milton uh, has joined in and he said that he thought that it was um, about plays and stuff too. So yeah, I always like to, um, I always like to clarify that. I get that one a lot. And uh, although that would be pretty cool to teach and talk about that as well, um, but we don't do that in this class. So hopefully everything else that we do talk about this month, you'll find just as interesting. So hopefully you leave session today with um, a little bit more about, you know, these benefits. And then, of course, at the end of the month, you know, have really embraced um, its importance, uh, both personally and professionally, like I was saying. So my adult equals serious slide. So I, I want you guys to think of um, a person in your life that's perhaps kind of falls into that category of all work, no play. And then I always like to ask, is that something that you're personally striving for? We are often told that you have to go to school and you have to get a job and work to support your family and that there's no time for play, that it's just for kids, we're adults, it's all serious business. And I want you to think about any messages that were relayed or insinuated between childhood to adulthood that pretty much supported this type of message. So. Um, to kickstart, let's head over to our material section um, on our go to training control panel and watch the elevator clip video. For those of you who are watching the archive on our YouTube channel, you can find the elevator clip link below the video in the description portion. So go ahead and watch the elevator clip and then let me know in the chat box when you're back.
Great. Welcome back. So how boring are regular stairs now after watching that clip? I definitely would like to have an elevator like that with that much action and fun going on in my building for sure. So just simply, you know, an activity and something as small as taking the time to dance and sing for a minute on the elevator definitely might have changed their whole day. Um, so when they get into the office, they may be smiling and, you know, it could have changed their attitude at work you know, all in, you know, just simply a matter of minutes. So play definitely brings joy. So the best part about play is that it brings joy. And if you don't have joy in your life, then you probably don't have excitement either. Um, so you are perhaps just going through a mundane routine, you know, not feeling very positive, maybe feeling, you know, sort of that weight of all of our responsibilities that we have as an adult on our shoulders. So, um, you know, now that we know that play definitely brings joy, you know, think about what happens when you feel joy. Think about how, how we feel when we feel joy. So, you know, are we, you know, feeling in a positive mood, maybe in a playful mood? So research shows that our needs for um, play doesn't go away when we grow up. Sometimes we have jobs that we, you know, perhaps have just uh, worked to earn a paycheck. And we have probably all had jobs that were not related to what we are passionate about, right? I'm sure we can all relate to that as part of our job experience. And, you know, but if we think about our favorite job that we've had, you know, in the past while we were growing up, whatever the case may be, think about why it was your favorite job. I know for me, I always like to share the example that one of my uh, most favorite jobs growing up, I love teaching, I love counseling, as you guys know, that is, you know, a part of me for so many years now. And when I think, when I was really thinking back about this question that I posed to you all, you know, in GTT, I'm like, you know, what was really fun, you know, for me growing up was definitely the first thing that popped in my head was working at a video store. And I might be dating myself a bit here um, because it's back when we had VHS before DVD. And um, I was actually transitioning out of working at a video store when DVDs were just coming out. But I was just thinking about, you know, that came to my first thought. I don't know what comes out for you guys as, you know, a fun job that you've had. Feel free to throw it out in the chat box if something's coming to mind for you as well. Um, but I used to have a lot of fun with my coworkers, and, and um, we used to dance around and watch movies on 16 screens and, you know, have a really great, uh, you know, rapport with a lot of the customers that would come in. And we used to get to screen movie trailers before they actually hit the shelves. So, you know, it was just a really, really, really great atmosphere. Let's see, I'm seeing uh, car detailing, and I'm also seeing uh, working at Fenway Park. Oh, definitely, a shout out to Fenway Park, Boston. I'm originally from a um, New England native, as you guys know, so I'm from Western Massachusetts, so that's awesome. Uh, yeah, there's a lot. I mean, with car detailing, you know, um, I used to know someone that used to do that as well, and they seem to always have a lot of fun at work, so I'll take your word for that, Milton. So, Think about, you know, um, how sometimes playing around at work can often be looked down upon, um, you know, but think about those jobs that you guys threw out and how, um, you know, being playful at that job, how it benefited you, you know, was it your out, you know, what did it benefit your outlook? Did it benefit, you know, the excitement to go to work, you know, looking forward to go to work? It didn't always seem like work, for instance. Um, you know, maybe it was the people, it was what you did. So all of those different aspects. So as we were just saying, play is often looked down upon at work. So you know, who really wants to work with someone who is miserable? I'm not sure if you guys know anyone like this. You know, perhaps they just hate life. They're negative all the time. They kind of can get that tunnel vision. And they sometimes have that incapacity to see new things and exciting ideas. Um, maybe they even hate change because to them that means that it's more work. So people who play see things completely different. 
as we have learned, you know, play can bring um, much joy and joy can definitely lower our stress and also make us more productive. So you may think, well, I can't play, I have to work. But however, if you stop to take a break to play, it may make your work much easier, much more enjoyable. And that is definitely why we have to play. So play can actually make you have less stress, like I was saying, be more productive. Um, definitely being um, playful, we can be more fun to be around. And then also coming up with a lot of creative ideas. And we all definitely want that, especially with the industries that we're in, right? So all of a sudden you may have ideas to solve a problem you may have never seen before and your relationships are also going to benefit from that. They're going to be better relationships. So all of these things are definitely going to help you be successful in your industries, which are very creative, right? Okay, so before we get into how to define play, I want to take us back to the beginning. Um, we probably all associate play with um, children, and this will help us to learn more about play by looking into our first experiences with it. So I want you to um, think about your first experiences of play and what you used to do, you know, back as a child, and throw out in the chat box, if you want to, some of the things that you used to like to engage in for play. And I'll try to remember to do those pauses in between because I know you guys are thinking and, you know, using the chat box and so forth. So what were some of your favorite activities as a child that stick out? Okay, I'm seeing uh, color, drawing, painting, uh, pretending, being uh, Ninja Turtles. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, so... For the sake of this class, sometimes I find students can get stuck with not knowing what to do for the assignments, especially since we have that creative component um, with the challenge projects each week. So what I want you to do is kind of reach in and, you know, touch base with that, you know, inner child, thinking back to you know, the things that you used to like to do. Um, I'm not saying, you know, okay, as adults and in this class, we're going to go out and we're all going to play games of hopscotch and, you know, sort of get back that, um, you know, that sense of playfulness, if you will. Um, you know, we're, we probably see that sense of playfulness in other ways now that we're adults, but that's what our intro activities this week are for. So I'm asking you in your discussion board this week to think back to those playful times. So definitely feel free to use coloring, drawing, painting, um, you know, pretending to be Ninja Turtles, you know, as your example to sort of tap in and discover what your play personalities are. So what we do in the discussion board post that's due tonight is we tap into what some of those um, fun activities were that we used to engage in as children. And we highlight that. And then we, you know, link it over to our concepts around, you know, qualities of play and these characteristics, and then our play personalities now as an adult. So that's what I'm looking for you to do with that. So these are definitely great starting points for that, for that piece tonight. So don't lose that. <clears throat> And that tapping into this sense of creativeness and things we used to enjoy and what our play personalities are now as an adult is definitely going to benefit you when it comes to completing those projects, our challenge projects each week. Okay, so research um, shows us that there are many benefits of play when it comes to learning. So play not just reduces stress and makes children more socially competent, which evidence suggests that it does, it matters also because play supposedly improves working memory and self-regulation. So in other words, it makes kids sharper and better behaved. So ironically, by shortchanging them on play in favor of academics, we may actually be inhibiting their development. So 
basically our overall message would be this, is that the emphasis on standardized testing, on attempting to constantly monitor, measure, and quantify what students learn has forced teachers to spend more of the school day engaged in uh, so-called direct instruction and has substantially reduced or eliminated opportunities that children have for exploring and uh, interacting with others and taking on learning on their own. So, uh, so recess has in many districts vanished from the schedule entirely. So after school, sometimes we might find ourselves or, you know, um, other parents shuttling their kids from activity to activity, depriving them of that unstructured time alone or with their friends. So some argue that play continues to be dismissed from the classroom, and many people remain skeptical at just how influential it can be. Um, so as I mentioned, you know, you may have kids or, um, you know, remember being in school as a child. And I always like to throw out the question of, do you think our schools support and value play? And some of us may compare that to when we were in school. And again, if you have children seeing them in school now. So, you know, do you think our schools support and value play? A lot of times that answer, you know, so often nowadays is no. Um, and then also, do you um, think that our classroom environments support play? So, you know, just some food for thought there. All right, so let's think a little bit about what your idea of play is today. So thinking about it today, you know, as an adult, what are your ideas about play? You know, um, what are some ways that you find that you would classify yourself as playing now as an adult? What are, are there things that you do on a daily basis, on a weekly basis that you would classify as play? And I'll give you I'll give you a little bit to type that out in the chat box. So I know for me, um, I'll share some I'll share some personal examples while you are thinking about it. I know for me, you know, I consider my adult play to be, um, you know, kayaking and scuba diving and canoeing and uh, swimming and so forth. So some of the things that I shared with you about my hobbies, you know, on the boards on our boards so far and then also in my intro video. So those are some ways that I play, um, but I also think about, um, you know, how I love to paint and I love to draw and I love to do, you know, kind of projects at home and stuff as well. All right. Um, let's see. I'm seeing in the chat box um, for me playing would be when I work on pictures in Photoshop. OK, yeah. Awesome. Go to the movies with my girl or taking pictures. Um, so I assume when you say taking pictures like photography, Milton. Okay, yeah, so photography, definitely. And, you know, um, I always like to throw out that, uh, you know, some of you may have an easy time thinking about how you play. And then on the other hand, some of you might play every day and know how important it is. And so it might not be new information, you know, for you. Yeah, um, photography is is great, even, you know, as a hobby, if it's not on the professional side. So definitely just getting out and either interacting with others, nature, you know, um, that's that's a great one. That's a great way to play. So. So. Anyway, so think about that. So think about the things that you are engaging in on a daily basis, a weekly basis. Think about how you see yourself playing today as an adult. The reason that I'm asking that and throwing that out is because when you're relating that to your play personalities on the discussion board, it's asking for some examples. So I'm just trying to lead you into posing some of these questions to get you thinking about that. That way you have perhaps a little bit easier of a time making those connections on the discussion board this week because you've already started thinking about that. You've already started making those connections with the concepts in your mind. So 
So we've talked briefly about um, some of the benefits of play in children as well as in adults. And when it comes to defining play, we all might have our own definition or what it means to you based on your experiences. So I'm definitely not here to tell you how to play or that your ideas about play are incorrect. I'm here to simply add to your knowledge in our materials, it talks about Stuart Brown, who wrote the book on um, play, how it shapes the brain, opens the imagination, and invigorates the soul. And he is the founder of the National Institute for Play. He talks about how to define play, but that it can be difficult because it means different things to different people. Play is going to mean different things to different people. So let's take a look at what he came up with. There are seven properties of play. And so as we're going through these, I want you to think about your favorite play activity and see if it fits with these properties. So like I was asking you before, think about things that you engage in now as an adult that you would consider playful or an act of play. And then let's see if it falls into these seven properties. So the first one on the list we have is apparently purposeless. and um, this sets play apart from other activities that are more goal-directed. When we play, we are not trying to gain anything necessarily. We play for the sake of playing, which is why there are people that say uh, perhaps it's a waste of time or, you know, we're not going to get any money out of it, for instance. So that's apparently purpose purposeless. Oh, and I'm seeing in the chat box, too, in regards to my question about um adult activities and play, um, seeing extreme sports, um, filmmaking, and everything in between, which is fabulous. Great examples. So number two on Stuart Brown's list is voluntary. So it's not required. You are volunteering to do it. When we play, we are doing so voluntarily. So as a side note, we try to encourage you to play in this class, but we run up against this quality um, as you're required to do certain activities and assignments leading to grades, of course. Um, so as you go through the class, you are given opportunities to choose various options. So every week on our challenge assignment, um, with the exception of week four, there's two options for the first three weeks, and it's so that way you have a choice and hopefully are attracted to um, one of the options perhaps over the other, and hopefully that elicits some excitement and some creativity in that process of completing the challenge project. So hopefully this choice will give you a chance to sort of access the quality of being voluntary to allow you to play within the assignments and, you know, the activity that you're choosing. So number three is inherent attraction. So you play simply because it's fun. Um, you feel naturally drawn to the activity. You may not be able to specifically uh, describe or explain what draws you to the activity, but that connection you feel is inborn. It's exciting. It's arousing as a cure for boredom. Then next we have freedom from time. So um, think of a time when you were engaged in an activity and you lost all sense of time while you were completing it, whether it was, you know, um, maybe drawing or painting or photography or, you know, filmmaking or participating in a sport. You just lost all sense of time while you were participating or completing the activity. You may have um, looked up from the painting or a computer monitor or sports practice or recording session or any other activity and realized that more time had actually passed than you thought. This is definitely an example of play. Um, we are not thinking about what we have to do next. We are just enjoying the moment. All right, number five on our list is a diminished consciousness of self. So similarly, um, excuse me, similarly to 
losing track of time. Some activities are um, just simply so enthralling that we also lose track of ourselves for a brief period. We are not worried about how we look, if we look awkward or we don't look smart or we look goofy, etc. You know, all of those worries simply just kind of go to the wayside. They go away. We're kind of, we're sort of in that zone and not worried about what others think of us or what it looks like to anyone else. You are just simply enjoying it. And number six, we have improvisational potential. So we are open to change. Uh, we are not locked into a rigid way of doing things. For instance, we might be engaged in totally irrelevant stuff that has nothing to do with our normal activities. Therefore, we are opening ourselves up to new behaviors and fresh ideas. Um, the play process is one that allows for improvising and making changes to the activity. Um, this is where uh, this is where we are seeing things in a different way. We can have fresh insights and creative ideas. And then lastly, number seven on our list is the continuation desire. So think of, think of if we are in true play, we have a desire to continue doing it, to continue participating in the activity. So the pleasure we get out of the play drives us to keep doing it. We are going to find ways to do it. Um, what are the things in my life I want to keep doing? And when it's over, I love it so much, I want to find time to do it again. So this week, we are going to um, be seeing if what you consider play falls under these seven qualities. So using these qualities of play, we can begin to decipher between true play and then other activities. So some of the activities you may have thought counted as play may not satisfy all of these categories that we just talked about. Okay, so next is going to be our characteristics of play. So we have decided that play can be valuable, right? But in Stuart Brown's book, play has more to do about the attitude and motivation than the specific activity itself. Remember, we, we highlighted that play is going to mean different things to different people, right? So you could have six people outside playing basketball, but only one of those six is really, really into it and not thinking about anything else but their enjoyment of just being in the game. So this is going to be considered that quote unquote true play that I was referring to. So it doesn't have to be an all or none type of situation. And children are more likely to engage in true play, that true play we were just identifying with at 100% versus adults. As, um, as adults, we are playing, um, we, we may not be able to be completely 100% into it because it can be difficult if, for instance, depending how much stress we have on our plate, right? So in adults, play is commonly blended with other motives like having to do with adult responsibilities. For instance, I mentioned I like to do stuff around the house like fix-it projects and you know, so forth. But at the same time, it's also serving another purpose. Gardening is serving another purpose. So it's, you know, falling into the area of beautifying my home or providing, you know, produce for my family and so forth. So sometimes those can be blended. So, um, so that's why in everyday conversation, we tend to talk about children playing and about adults bringing perhaps a, um, a playful attitude or a playful spirit to their activities. Um, so it's all about your attitude and motivation during the activity. Okay, so as far as psychology of play goes this month, um, you might be thinking in this class, being about play, we actually get to play, right? Well, in this course, you are going to get the chance to put your play skills into action. Um, so 
like I mentioned, we give you the choices on the weekly challenge projects so that you can pick what most appeals to you. And we encourage you to challenge yourself with new technology when you are doing your creative components of the challenge assignments. Like I was saying, it's a great month to practice some new skills, to get acclimated with some different tools, and to experiment. Um, you might not always find that in all of your classes, depending on the content and the material and what you're covering. So it only seems right that in our psychology of play class where we're trying to bring that playfulness into our personal and professional lifestyles that we, you know, be able to experiment a bit and practice with new things this month. So, you know, I'll also be asking you to apply the concepts you learn to the real world life. So ideally through having more choices, like I said, in the options in class, you get to have more fun through your work while maintaining the boundary of working within deadline frames. Deadlines, as you know, are going to be really important when it comes to your industry. It's important um, when it comes to completing classwork and so forth, you know, on time. So even though we're having fun, we're having options with the assignments and so forth this month month and I'm asking you to dive into being more playful and hone in on that, we maintain that boundary of having a deadline and time frames. And we get more into the balance of play and more of those boundaries as we bring the month together in week four. So let's take a look at the value of play as an adult and head on over to your materials section and click on the value of play link and take a look at it and let me know when you're back by typing in the chat box. All right, welcome back. I hope you guys enjoyed that. So this week, I'll be asking you to look um, back into your childhood like we already started in session and try to remember the play activities you enjoyed growing up, right? So um, like I mentioned previously, for some of you, that might be a little bit easier than others. And some of you may actually continue to enjoy some of those activities today, depending on like, you know, uh, the creativity, sports, etc. I find that a lot of times, depending what we enjoyed as a child, we do still often enjoy some level of that now as adults. So to understand more about our own play history, we want to um, we want to look at our own patterns of play and play personalities that have shaped our current use of play. Um, so now I just want to uh, mention this section of the material explores three different areas or ideas. Um, so one being the types of play, two being the patterns. And like I mentioned, we'll 
take a look at the time as far as play personalities, um, but we have a great video for that on the platform. So for the sake of time, um, you know, we'll go ahead and start out with discussing the patterns of play. So I always try to highlight as much material as we can each week in our go-to training session, but definitely it's not all inclusive. So make sure that you're also, you know, referring to your playbook as well. I was advancing there on the slide there. Sorry. Um, let me go ahead and come back. So for um, for patterns of play, we're going to go through these, and uh, it might be helpful for you to think of your own children if you have them or children that you're perhaps around. And I want you to think about have you ever watched them actually play? Um, just kind of sat back, went into observation mode, and watched them play. Um, well, we are going to look at the different patterns of play that you might see in those instances. So I'm going to go through them and describe them in brief. Um, you know, our article in our playbook definitely goes into a bit more detail on each of them. But let's go through them. So first we have attunement play. And at... Um, age three or four months, as a mom and a baby gaze into each other's eyes, the baby will smile and the mother will automatically respond with this uh, surge of emotion and smile back. This is universal across all cultures around the globe. When attunement occurs, both the parent and the child experience a joyful union and a lot of times this can be referred to as bonding. And this experience is one of the most basic states of play and it becomes a foundation for the much more complex states of play. So next we have body play and movement. And infants begin to play um, to make sense of their bodies very early. So think about squirming and crawling and putting things in their mouth. Um, these are all ways of discovering their environment. Um, they are all intrinsic behaviors that, uh, that promote exploration and also learning. So for example, the play-driven movement of leaping upward is a lesson about gravity as well as one's own body. And it lights up the brain and fosters learning. So movement helps sculpt the brain and ready the player for the unexpected or the unusual. So as children grow, they are still doing this, right? Sort of testing their body boundaries. Um, I remember when I worked as a counselor with elementary age kids, I would walk this boy who was eight from the residential facility to therapy offices. And so I always pose the question, you know, do you guys think that he walked in a street? straight line from point A to point B. No, the answer is definitely no there. Um, he would touch everything and he would swing around every single tree and he would zigzag through the grass and skip a step when climbing up the stairs and jumping out of the way when someone would pass and so forth. And his teachers often yelled at him when he would do that in line, for instance, at school, but I allowed him to make our walk playful. Um, and it started our therapy sessions in a really positive, engaged way. So next on our list, we have object play. Our curiosity often drives us to pick up and about and play with objects. Um, it is an innately fun pattern of play and creates its own states of playfulness. Um, hands playing with all types of objects or toys and finding ways to use them help brains develop beyond strictly uh, manipulative skills with play as the driver of this developer. Um, so there has been a connection found between problem solving and manipulating objects. Um, so for instance, if we think about kids that fix things or take things apart and explore uses for them may mean that they will be more able to solve concept problems as an adult. So with social play from the uh, simplest of um, wrestling of young animals to the most complex banter of close friends. Social play is a key aspect of play behavior. Um, children that play together are learning a lot of empathy. They are learning how to set boundaries. They're also learning how to listen and communicate with each other. And 
these are really great social skills that we carry into adulthood, right? So next on our list, we have imaginative and pretend play. Um, imagination is perhaps the most powerful human ability. Um, it allows us to create made up realities that we can explore without giving up access to the real world. Throughout life, imagination remains a key to emotional resilience and creativity. Think about children playing house or playing school. In this pretend play, they can act out what they will, um, what will be eventually real life situations. With storytelling and narrative play, um, making sense of the world, its parts, and one's particular place in it is a central aspect of early development. And so as we grow, uh, stories, either ones we are told from our parents or are read to us before bed, enliven us and help us understand ourselves and others. They grant us that permission to um, expand our own inner stream of consciousness and enrich our personal personal narratives with pleasure and fun as our own life stories unfold. So being lost in a story can produce a sense of timelessness, uh, pleasure, and a way that we can try to sense what it would be like to be involved in that storyline, so to speak. With transformative, integrative, and creative play, uh, because play is all about trying on new behaviors, it frees us from our usual patterns of doing things. Children are always in the process of changing and becoming um, becoming through fantasy play, so it often goes unnoticed. For adults, uh, think about daydreams may give rise to new ways of doing business. Fantasies may lead to new love visualization may lead to a remodeled house or a new invention. Uh, creative play takes our minds to places that we have never been. So let's test your knowledge. I'm going to throw out a test for you. We're going to watch a video clip where we are going to listen to two children playing naturally. Now it's kind of a funny context, um, which, you know, Hopefully you guys appreciate, have a little laugh break after all of these concepts that we covered. Um, but as you are watching this video, I want you to see if you can identify what patterns you notice in their play. So head on over to your material section again, and we are going to watch the kids snippet cooking video, kids snippet cooking video, and look for those patterns of play and let me know when you're back by typing in the chat box.
All right, so I think most of you are finishing up the video. So what patterns of play did you notice in the video with, with the cooking video? What patterns that we talked about were present out of the ones we were just mentioning? Did you notice any of them? And if you did, which ones? So I'll scan, I'll scan back up and see if anything, anything stuck out to you. So we had uh, storytelling, transformative and integrative play, imaginative and pretend play, social play, object play, body play, body play and movement, excuse me, and then attunement play. So did you notice any of those in that, in that quick kid snippet cooking video. Okay, body play and movement. Yeah, definitely. Imaginative, imaginative and pretend play. Anything else? It's, it's actually a really, really great example of all of them. It incorporates all of them across the board. So that's why I chose it. Um, it has a little bit of each one and kind of gives us, um, you know, that kind of fun, um, fun way to watch it as well. Like I said, it was a little bit, you know, presented in a little bit of a different fashion, but um, that's just to kind of bring all of those together in a little quick video snippet. But it's a really great example of all of them. So let's talk a little bit about the um, about the research component. So um, now to get you know a little bit more in detail about how you can play as an adult, we said that we were going to talk about that a little bit. So we will look at the research behind this as well as things you can begin to do now to incorporate play in your life. Um, so play as a concept is often thought of as um, something that children do, right? We've highlighted that a lot in this lesson today. However, the truth is that the elements of play stick with us well into adulthood. So in his book, Play, author and psychiatrist Stuart Brown compares play to oxygen. He writes, and I quote, it's all around us, yet goes mostly unnoticed or unappreciated until it is missing end quote. So this might seem surprising until you consider everything that constitutes as play. So play is art, play is books, movies, music, comedy, flirting, and even daydreaming. So not only can play bring us joy in our adult lives, but it can also reinforce valuable abilities such as problem solving and creative thinking. And those are definitely attributes we want to continue to have as adults, right? Problem solving and creative thinking. So the research shows us some very valuable benefits of play as adult. So here are some lifelong benefits of play. So play connects us to others and strengthens our sense of community. It can heal disagreements and emotional wounds and improve the quality of our relationships. Play fosters that creativity that we've highlighted, flexibility and learning. Play stimulates our imaginations, helping us adapt and solve problems. Play arouses curiosity, which leads to discovery and more of that creativity that we want. So the components of play, curiosity, discovery, novelty, risk-taking, uh, trial and error, games, social etiquette, and other increasingly complex adaptive activities are the same as the components of learning. So play is an antidote to loneliness, isolation, anxiety, and depression. And when we play vigorously, we trigger a mix of endorphins that lift our spirits and distractions that distance us from pain, fear, and other burdens. And we'll get more into the brain aspect in week two. And when we play with other people, whether they're friends or strangers, we are reminded that we are not alone in this world. Um, we can connect to others in delight and meaningful ways that can banish that loneliness. So play definitely teaches us perseverance and the rewards of learning or mastering 
a new game teach us that that perseverance is worthwhile. Um, perseverance is a trait necessary to a, to a healthy adulthood. Uh, it is largely, um, it's learned largely through play. So perseverance and violence are rarely two components that are found together. So play makes us happy. We've talked about that. Beyond all of these excellent uh, reasons for playing, there is simply the sheer joy of it. And we highlighted that at the beginning of the session. We talked about that joy. So play is a state of being that is happy and joyous. Jumping into and out of the world of play on a daily basis can preserve and nourish our own hearts and the hearts of our communities. So in, in retro, you know, in retrospect, and to sum it up, a little play goes a long way. That's a great statement. So a little play goes a long way. We don't need to play every second of the day to enjoy the benefits of play. So in, um, in his book, Brown, Stuart Brown calls play a catalyst. A little bit of play, he writes, can go a long way towards boosting our productivity and happiness. So Brown goes on to explain that the opposite of play is not work. He says that actually the opposite of play is depression. Um, when do we feel the happiest? When there is a variety or when there is change? When we are, when are we challenged and accomplished? If we are burdened by an overwhelming sense of responsibility, then this brings decreased happiness. But society tells us to be successful. We don't have time to play. We have to hurry up and get there. But really, where are we trying to get? So if we give up on play for so long, how will we be able to enjoy whatever goals we are actually trying to achieve? So how will we know when we get there or will we just fill our lives with more to-do lists, more tasks, and sort of never-ending goals um, to be bigger, better, and make more money? And then at the end, will any of the money, bonuses, or good grades, for instance, matter if our hearts aren't really into it? So will it matter if we have uh, a constant feeling that something is missing in our lives? Yeah, definitely. Work can also fall into play. And that's where we really bring to light um, reading that comment in the chat box. Um, for those of you listening to the archive and aren't present live, um, the comment in the chat box is work can also fall into play, right? And that's, that's ideally what brought you here to school, which is, you know, getting into industries that you're passionate about, you know, really being able to, um, you know, dive into your creativity and, you know, master, you know, all of these different skills and, you know, technical skills and so forth. And so ideally, you know, at the end of the day, work isn't necessarily feeling like work. You're getting up, you're excited, you have passion, you have drive, and you have motivation to, you know, go and do what it is. And work and, you know, the financial stability of that is sort of that byproduct. Going and getting into something that you already love to do and feel passionate about is the ideal goal, right? So, None of us really want to get up every day and go do something that we're really not invested into and we don't care to do. Like I was mentioning before, we've probably all sort of had those jobs that we've just had to take to maybe kind of pay the bills, you know, so to speak, but we weren't necessarily perhaps looking into it as a career. It wasn't something we could necessarily see ourselves doing every single day. It wasn't necessarily driving our passion, right? So depending what you do for work now, if you're already doing things that are involved in your industry, industry, um, you know, and you might work somewhere where you really do enjoy, you know, enjoy it and it feels like play. It doesn't always necessarily feel like work to you. So definitely, definitely yes with that. So I want to head on that note, um, let's head over to our material section and take a look at how we can create and implement play in um, all different types of ways. So we are going to watch the clip, Never Leave the Playground. And for those of you, again, watching the archive on YouTube, it'll be posted in the description portion under the video. And for those of us here, it's called Never Leave the Playground. Click on that link in your materials section and let me know when you're back in the chat box.
All right, so it looks like you guys are finishing up with the video. His ingenuity is definitely fascinating. So I know we highlighted that everyone's play is different a little while ago in the session. So, um, so some of you may be thinking, no problem there. You know, I feel great. I'm good to go. And some of you may be thinking, well, man, how do I get that feeling back? Um, you know, I want to feel that energy. I want to feel that joy. So let's talk a little bit about Brown says, um, how Brown says we can get it back. So, um, you know, so it sounds like I might be telling you to go outside, like I mentioned, play hopscotch every day, and this will bring back a sense of uh, play into your life. And, you know, I wish it were as simple as that, um, but that's not the case. And there's no one way uh, sort of miracle strategy that's going to work for everyone. So again, because everyone's play is different. So Brown gives um, some suggestions to get you sort of on track to reconnecting with those emotions that you've experienced in that true play state that we talked about. So how can you add play to your life? So here are a few tips from the experts. So they highlight to change how you think about play. Um, you have to get rid of the guilt or the feeling that you are wasting your time. And I know that we run up against this in every class. I'll get feedback from students and they'll say, you know, it was just so refreshing to know that I'm not wasting my time by spending some time playing video games or going outside, you know, to the park or participating in sports or spending hours, you know, reading or drawing or painting. Painting. So, you know, definitely having to move past that guilt or that feeling like we're wasting our time. So remember that it's helping all aspects of your life and that play is important for all aspects of our lives, including the creativity and those relationship components that we were highlighting. So, so give yourself that permission to play a little bit every day. You know, like we were mentioning before, you don't have to play all day, every day, but, you know, how can you incorporate that a bit more, especially if you're thinking, hey, maybe that's lacking a little bit in my life. So give yourself that permission to play a little bit each day. So Brown also suggests that you look to your past for those play memories. Um, what did you do as a child that excited you? We talked about that a little bit. I asked you to think about that. Um, did you engage in those activities alone or were you with others? Or maybe that was a little bit of both. So how can you recreate that today to reconnect with those emotions? So another one of the tips is to surround yourself with playful people. So it's helpful. You're in this class this month. You're surrounded by classmates. You're surrounded by, you know, you have an instructor. We're all here to, you know, highlight play and bring back that sense of playfulness. So, you know, look for that in other areas as well, either work or at home, you know, try to incorporate others and, you know, do you have folks around you that are already playful? Is there a way to bring back that sense of playful by sharing class concepts with them and trying new activities? Okay. So maybe get your family on board. So when we surround ourselves with um, friends and loved ones who are playful, a positive environment can definitely support our sense of play. And another suggestion would be to uh, perhaps play with little ones if you have them at home. Maybe some of you have kids or grandkids. Um, maybe some of you have pets, you know, as well. Um, maybe you have a dog or a cat and, you know, being able to take them to the dog park or, you know, engage with others who have, you know, pets as well. So playing with kids definitely helps us to um, experience the magic of play through their perspective. Remember, we were talking about, you know, that observation. Um, so anytime you think uh, play is a waste, remember that it offers some serious benefits for both you and others. So as Brown says in his book, play is the purest expression of love. Brown does stress that we uh, we don't need to play every second of every day, which I highlighted as well. You only need a little bit of play to boost your joy, to boost your creativity and your happiness. So it really is just a start to get you kind of back on track. Um, so by taking that time to play, you can clear your mind of the clutter, the stress, the negativity, and then you can ideally focus again. So with a renewed sense of optimism and creativity. 
All right, so today we took a look at your play history to examine those patterns of play. We talked about the properties so you can understand a little bit more about what play really is all about and how it can be valuable to you as an adult. Um, so we also, you know, took a look at that importance and what constitutes as play. So hopefully you got a sense from today's lesson on how you can begin to incorporate a little bit more play into your life. Um, like I mentioned, some of you might be okay in that department and others might be saying, you know, oh, I really feel like I could use a little bit more of that. So again, um, you know, with any of the uh, content in module one, definitely make sure that you're going through your reading. Um, I wanted to wrap up, um, you know, with any questions that you have about the reading so far that maybe you've already dived into or any questions maybe on the content that we've gone over so far today. So you can let me know either by typing in the chat box or raising your hand. Um, those of you that are listening to the archive, if your question's not answered in the session or, you know, on on our platform, then definitely don't hesitate to reach out to uh, myself. You can also use our community board to post questions as well. So are there any questions for those of you who are alive right now with me that I might be able to assist you with? And in case anyone is typing in the chat box, I'll also throw out if there's any questions with regard to our week one activities. I am also willing to go over those, you know, as well to be of help. Okay. I'll continue to look and well, um, since we have a few minutes left of session, I'll go ahead and I'll just bring up some of the tabs that I have open. Uh, the first one being our psychology of play classroom, um, our activity dashboard. My view uh, from the instructor side might look a little bit different than your student side, of course, um, but I always like to highlight this intro essentials and weekly buzz category up here. Uh, Anytime you have technical issues in the class, either with um, submitting, with downloading, with gaining access to the library, for instance, um, any of those technical type of concerns, you definitely want to go ahead and reach out to LAO support. Um, they are open um, all but I think maybe four or six hours a day um, in the overnight hours, and they're open on weekends as well. So give them a call, send them an email to produce a ticket, reach out to them for any technical concerns that that you have this month. It's a great resource that you guys have access to. Definitely use it. Um, so up here we also have our playbook. Um, highlight some professionalism, if you will. It's just a great month to continue practicing that in regards to, um, you know, trying to get away from maybe texting lingo and so forth um, that I know some of us are, you know, use on a daily basis. But when it comes to the professional world and formulating emails and messages, you know, we should try to steer away from that a bit. Up here, your Clubhouse go-to training recordings. If you ever miss a live session, you can go ahead and click here. And in that activity is the link over here to our Classroom YouTube channel. So we'll have our October go-to training archives. If you click on the playlist button, you'll see our October ones. Right now, there's no videos. I'll archive it after the session concludes today. And I'll go ahead and post it here. So definitely just look for the archives there. And again, the links we use in session will be on the video description portion. I see a lot of activity. I'm so excited about the game that we're playing on our community board this week um, in regards to the tr two truths, one lie. So I'm excited to see everyone's responses maybe come the end of the end of the week or so when we start to reveal what our two truths and one lie is. So I've been having a lot of fun with that activity. Um, what we have to do tonight is our level one library training, okay? So basically what I'm looking for um, for everyone with this activity is to make sure you can access our library, you can get into EBSCOhost, and you can pull up an article. Um, you 
have the option to include, you know, articles and references, of course, throughout the class when you're working on your projects. But then in future months where it is definitely mandatory, I want to make sure everyone's practiced that access this month. I know you had a great tutorial in, uh, in DGL or perhaps a go-to training archive in DGL regarding library access, but we want to put that to use this month. So this level one, this first part, you'll see it's an assignment. You don't have anything to submit here. This is the instruction. So you'll just submit that you're completing the activity. Once you go ahead and use the instructions in this aspect, you'll go ahead and follow them. You'll access that article on EBSCOhost, and then you'll use the article to take the library training quiz right here, which is the test. So there's five quick, simple questions that I pulled from the article. And again, my main point here is to make sure everyone has access to EBSCOhost and knows how to pull the article. So use this level one for the instructions and part two, the quiz. And that's due this evening and it's worth 4%. And it helps to let me know also that you are active in class and plan on participating this month. Our discussion party, Wednesday initial post. Every Wednesday our initial post will be due. So that's also due tonight. Those are the two activities due tonight. If you ever miss the Wednesday initial post, Sunday the board closes, that's the final deadline, you're going to want to make an additional response post, okay? So initial posts are due Wednesday, you're making two full response posts to classmates, but if you miss the Wednesday one, you're going to want to make your initial post and then three posts to classmates, and that'll help you uh, recover the 10 late points on that, okay? And I always like to highlight with our brain teaser, it's an open book quiz. It's open all week. Take advantage of time with that, okay? Spend the time here. The answers are right in front of you, so really strive for 100% on this activity. It's open all week and it's open book, okay? And like I was mentioning, our challenge assignment, we have one of them due every Sunday as well. I'm going to go ahead and move my go-to training control panel over here a bit, and I'm going to open the week one challenge options folder. In it, the suggested program use. This is the activity resource list I was referring to. These are all different web tools, software, etc., that you can use in any week of class to build those challenge projects, okay? So I'm going to look for your presentations to be built within a web tool, a piece of software. It doesn't have to be something specifically on this list. I just put this together to kind of give you a starting point and hopefully get those creative juices flowing. I myself use uh, Storybird, Prezi, and I'll use PictoChart as well as Pinterest this month in order to present our go-to trainings every week. So you have a lot of options here. Um, this is just to get you started. Here are some instructions on how to install Adobe Reader in case you don't have that. It's free, so you're going to want to go ahead and take a look at this. That way you can go ahead and have Adobe Reader in order to save your PDF documents and um, any changes and be able to open it. And we'll open one of the options. This is the Playhouse Rocks option this week. This is what I was referring to as your PDF template, okay? You'll notice every week that I'm going to be looking for this template to be completed as well as your separate creative piece, okay? So what you're going to do is read through the instructions every week on the PDF that you choose, depending which project you choose to complete. You'll go ahead and type your answers in the boxes that are provided. Then you're going to want to go ahead, if you use a web tool, you're going to want to include it right here in the box that's provided. If you create something separate, like a PowerPoint, for instance, then you can just go ahead and um, submit that along with this completed PDF. And then I'll open your PowerPoint manually. But if it's some type of web tool, you can go ahead and include the link within your PDF. You're also going to want to use this final checklist. The reason it's here is I'm just looking to make sure that you're acknowledging that you followed all of the instructions on the assignment, OK? And uh, just take a note if you're using any of those alternative submissions, like, you know, for instance, you're not doing uh, completing like a web tool using your uh, present, making your presentation a web tool, then for PowerPoint, for instance, um, for those of you that might have a Mac, Keynote, um, something to that effect. 
And then here's your grading rubric. This is how I'm going to be grading your challenge project each week. And so you're going to want to strive for the exceptional category, of course, for all points possible. And every week I'll be providing you feedback down here in this portion, notating, you know, what you did well, considerations for the following week's project, if there's any area that you could look to grow in, okay? So let me open option two. This is the industry presentation. Playhouse Rocks is if you are wanting to educate your audience on concepts of your choosing. And the industry presentation is just that. You're basically going to be selling yourself to your audience, which of course your audience this month is me. But just as with the Playhouse Rocks template assignment, you're going to want to type your answers to all of the questions I'm posing to you on this form. You're going to want to put your web link here, and then you're going to want to acknowledge the check boxes. So you have a PDF template to complete and respond to the questions every week, and you have a creative presentation built from that, okay? And um, I always like to highlight that I'll be looking for like two to three minutes of video. I'll be looking for um, two to four pages of written content, you know, and so forth. So we're definitely striving for college level work with this. So um, sorry if I spent a lot of time on that. I just always like to make it clear that with those challenge projects, I am looking for you com to complete both aspects, the written portion on the PDF and then the creative presentation. And those are worth 12% every week. So they're kind of a big deal, but at the same time, it's the area where you have the most flexibility and options and choices, you know, and so forth. Um, so there's a lot of flexibility there in how you decide to deliver your presentation, okay? I mentioned the survey at the beginning. You can grab that link in the GoTo Training area up here, the Clubhouse GoTo Training recordings. There's a link that takes you to this Google survey right here, which depicts times between Tuesdays and Wednesdays that you are available to attend the live session. Again, um, that's if you were planning on attending the live sessions, of course, this month. Um, if you were just planning on watching the archives, that's absolutely fine. Um, but I definitely want to gather a sense uh, for those of you trying to attend the live ones when your availability is. So just take a moment to do that at some point. That'll close this Sunday. So just take some time to complete that this week or over the weekend. Now, I didn't see any questions pop up in the chat box. Um, I just want to make sure there's none for my folks who are here live before we end the session today. And if anything comes up after, um, after we close out the session, guys, definitely don't hesitate, like I said, to use our community board um, to reach out. Um, I emailed everybody and let you know that I'm a fan of using our platform versus um, bombarding you with emails each day or every week in class. So this message feature up here, this is a great option to go ahead and just shoot me a quick message. Um, and then that way we can always connect, take a look at my office hours that I have every uh, every weeknight. I think of my work week as Monday through Friday. Um, you know, I like for you to at least open up and look at your activities during the week. Let's connect on any questions. I know sometimes stuff can come up over the weekend and I make an effort to go ahead and check my messages, but I'm definitely not going to check them as readily as I will um, Monday through Friday. So you will get a response, but um, there might be more of a delay in that response on the weekend than versus the, you know, during the week. So let's connect during my office hours. Um, you know, take a look at those things. If anyone wants to submit work early and have me review it and give it back to you for any sort of final tweaking, then, um, you know, I definitely would want that work submitted to me by Thursday night, Friday morning to give me a chance to look at it and send it back to you with um, any thoughts. All right, perfect. Well, I didn't see any questions pop up and I uh, saw a couple notes about not having any questions. So uh, fabulous. Thank you for coming out today. I definitely appreciate those of you who can make it um, and maybe some of those listening in onto the archive, we can uh, meet with you live next week. So thank you so much, guys. And I look forward to seeing what you guys create. And I'll be hopping back onto our boards a little bit later uh, this evening as well to check them out. 
okay, perfect. A question did come up. Go ahead. Um, if you want to raise your hand and hop on the mic or if you want to type it out in the chat box, either way, I'll go ahead and, uh, and hang out for that question. And those of you that don't have any questions, you know, feel free to go ahead and take off. I don't want to, I don't want to run over on your time too much. Okay, so the question in the chat box, um, since those of you listening to the archive don't have access to the to the chat box, the question was, how can I view uh, the presentation? Um, I'm not sure if you meant view it or create it. I'm thinking you meant create it. Just just let me know if that's what you meant. Okay, perfect. In your week one folder, and I've included it in every week, but you know, for the sake of this week, in your week one folder, um, I always recommend starting out, complete the answers and type them out on the PDF first, following the instructions. So that way it helps you kind of dive into the concepts and applying them and the material. And then from there, create the creative presentation. And a great place to start is if you're like, I don't know how I want to present my presentation this week, I need some suggestions, then head on over to this activity resource list and maybe consider using one of these mediums to present it. So you have the two options. You have Playhouse Rocks. And what you're doing is you're basically creating an animation for this project, okay? So down here are the deliverables and you're creating a short film and then you're including a transcript and then you're also including your written responses. So what you're doing is you're choosing some concepts from over here under the directions portion on the right hand side and then you're going to go ahead and in your short film you're going to answer the following questions right down here where I'm scrolling with my mouse. So you want to answer those four questions within your short film. So start out by answering, you know, um, the questions. I mean, you can go both ways. You can do the presentation first and then answer the questions. Some find it helpful to answer some of the questions and then start building their presentation. It's completely up to you. Um, but you're going to want to respond to the questions here. And so, for instance, in the instructions, I'm looking for five to seven sentences. So just make sure that you're focusing on that. But however you want to create the short film for this project, this is where the activity resource list can come in handy for you. OK, so you could create, um, for instance, a Powtoon. OK, that's a really great tool to go ahead and have fun with and create. Um, it has animation and color and images and you can have different um, you have different methods to uh, include written material in there. So Powtoon is a great tool that could work for that. It's a free tool as well. And then GoAnimate.com is also a free tool that you could create the animation from. And basically with the Playhouse Rocks, you're basically teaching your audience about the concepts that you're choosing to teach about, okay? With the GoAnimate, um, something that I would notate about it is, um, just like I did here on the sheet, is that you can do uh, 60 seconds or one minute with the free version. So since I'm looking for two to three minutes to demonstrate proficiency, what you're going to want to do is create two to three go animate cartoons so it can just be a continuation from one into the second one um, and into a third one if you wanted to have a third one and then you would just include you know both or all three of those links on your um, pdf template and let me go back to the resource list to point out um, powtoon is great go animate is great and um, depending what you did with PowerPoint or Keynote and images or Google Slides and images or even Storyboard like we did, you know, today. These are all options as well. Um, it just depends on how you want to go ahead and create like that, that short, that um, animated short. <laughs> 
with the industry presentation, <clears throat> excuse me, it's going to be the same thing. <coughs> excuse me, I have a tickle in my throat where you're going to answer the questions. And in step two here, you have an interview with a huge entertainment company. So basically, you are selling yourself. So going back to this activity resource list, you can pull from any of the tools that you want in order to build your presentation. So whether you decide to sell yourself by video, by cartoon animation, um, by a slideshow with, you know, images perhaps, um, you could do it in either, you know, either setup. Okay, great. I'm glad that I was able to help answer your question. I know it's kind of going back over, you know, back over everything, but I just wanted to make sure that there's, you know, definitely that understanding and that, and that clarity for you. Perfect. And if any other questions come up um, when you, when you kind of get in there and start looking at everything, just let me know, of course, as well. All right, any other questions that I might be able to help with? Great, okay guys, we'll have a wonderful rest of your day. Again, thanks so much for coming out and um, I look forward to seeing what you all come up with and create this week for week one. So take care and I hope to see you next week if you can make it out.